Great. It's uh, being recorded. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. We are recording uh, so that we can share this work session, I guess you could call it, with um, with folks who can't make it today. So uh, you will be filmed, I guess, as a warning. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm Kelly Reed, a planner with Oregon City, and I've been uh, kind of supporting the TDM working group um, for the past few years. And we have our um, consulting team here from Rick Williams Consulting, um, along with city, city staff, and we've invited some kind of uh, stakeholders from the business community uh, to talk about the uh, results of the parking study that we completed last fall. Um, we collected a lot of great data and Rick uh, and Pete are going to tell us about it. Um, and then we want to have a dialogue with you about what the data is telling us um, and what actions we could take to better manage our parking resources in Oregon City. Um, so. I just want to tell you a little bit about kind of where we're at and where we're going with this. Um, we, uh, so we have lots of data, we have lots of kind of information and, and um, you know, comments that have been coming in from the business community. We kind of know um, some of what, uh, you know, kind of people feel about parking out there, but um, we want to have these uh, these meetings, including this one and a few others this month and next month where we're talking to stakeholders. Um, we're talking to people in the McLaughlin neighborhood uh, up on the bluff. We're talking to people in the business community, um, employees work downtown. Um, and after we have those conversations, um, we're going to go to the city commission during a work session. This will probably happen in May or June um, and share with the city commission kind of what we've heard. Um, and where we think, you know, what actions we are thinking might make sense to take. Um, and then once we receive direction from the city commission at that work session, then we would move forward with, you know, implementing changes to our parking program um, if directed to do so by the city commission. Um, any questions about process before I hand it over to, uh, oh, Rick and Pete, and actually we should do maybe a little round introductions. Okay, any questions about process before we do that? Okay. Um, well, I'll let you take it away then, and then we can go around the room. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Rick. Rick Oops. I'm Rick Williams with Rick Williams Consulting. And I'm Pete Collins with Rick Williams Consulting. Um, Nick, do you want to? I'm uh, Nick Borowski, uh, downtown. Uh, property owner. I've got a parking lot across the street here, 22 spaces, and then parking lot downtown is 12 spaces. And Nick's been involved in this since the very beginning. 2009. <laughs> I'm Vicki Yates. Um, we own the Singer Hills Cafe in that building, and I also live on High Street on the block. Liz Hannum, I'm the executive director for the Downtown Oregon City Association. Brian Kersey, Code Enforcement and Parking Manager for Oregon City. Nancy Bush, owner of White Park Grill and Brooklyn. And former Parking <laughs> 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 Manager in the city. Well, thanks everybody for being here this morning. My name is Ann Griffin. I work in the Economic Development Department here in Oregon City, and we appreciate everybody's time uh, this morning. All right. Thanks, everyone. So uh, I'm going to do a brief presentation, hopefully about 20 minutes, and then we can open it up to discussion. I know Anne, Ryan, and Kelly are pretty familiar with this data, but we'll go over and largely focusing on the downtown. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the bluff because they are interrelated, uh, and then go, go into recommendations and some considerations, which we can then open it up to a discussion. Um, so really appreciate being here. Um, Rick and I were saying this is our first actual meeting in person as opposed to just seeing this much uh so we did have to dress up so uh <laughs> thanks do, for being here yeah i do also want to recognize that we have two folks on zoom ray atkinson is, uh, is has called in and also scott riley who is with communications northwest so okay. thank you both for for participating yeah thank you uh and if you could go to the next slide that'd be great so here's a brief agenda um 
and Kelly teed it up perfectly. So uh, overall, we're going to just talk about some of the data that we collected in September in 2021. Uh, and then what we did was compare it to the 2016 data that we had collected, so pre-pandemic. Um, and then we really dug in when we did the data collection, we collected it on both days in downtown as well as up on the bluff, collecting on and off street data. So the on street data was more nuanced. It was turnover data. So collecting the full license plate so we could really dive into some key metrics there. Uh, and then the off street data we collected, I want to say it was 96% uh, downtown and 91% was it up on the bluff. Um, so a number of the private and public off street lots, we collected occupancy data there. Um, we use that information comparing and contrasting from 2016, as well as looking at the 2009 uh, parking management plan, and then came up with some considerations and recommendations, um, which we've worked with the city staff, but we would certainly want to hear from community, some community input on these recommendations as we move forward. Uh, we also have some system wide recommendations, which are primarily for uh, the city, um, but want to talk about those too. Uh, and then we'll have some discussion, obviously, at the end. So uh, next slide, please. So again, this is more or less an overview. We updated the 2016 parking study findings. Um, we looked at both the weekday and weekend, knowing that there's, there's a difference. So people are accessing downtown differently during those times. So we looked at, a, I think it was Thursday, September 21st or 23rd, I want to say, and Saturday, September 18th were the two days that we collect data. In 2016, we collected data in July. Um, and we also collected, as I mentioned, on-street formats, so time stays, whether the stalls were metered, unmetered, uh, looking at the permit system, so there are 119 on-street permits downtown, uh, as well as the no-limit stalls. There are 27 no-limit stalls downtown also. Uh, collecting, as I mentioned, the off-street occupancy data. So we collected um, 803 off-street stalls on 47 sites in downtown. Uh, and we used that information and did kind of a high level assessment of the rates, knowing that you guys have 50 cent rate, 50 cent per hour rates in the downtown core, as well as hour, or I'm sorry, a dollar in the downtown core, 50 cents. Mix that up a little bit. Um, and then looking at enforcement, currently uh, on street is enforced Monday, Monday through Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and then wanted to wrap that up and to understand what's the user experience. How are people, customers, visitors coming into downtown? Are they being prioritized? How can we make sure that this system is managed most efficiently? Um, we uh, looked at the bluff data. It hasn't been collected since 2008. So bluff is certainly a bit more residential in nature, but there are certainly pockets of commercial. Um, as we can step outside, we can see that. Uh, again, they are collected on the same days, looking at the on-street format, as well as the off-street uh, occupancy rates, or occupancy we also looked at, uh, wrapped it up into recommendations. So again, we looked at some of the recommendations were, that were in 2000, the 2009 plan and wanted to update those, seeing where they were now, where, have they come to fruition, and do we need to tweak things? Uh, so next slide, please, Anne. So here are the study boundaries, uh, the downtown, has had 465 on-street stalls. Again, looking at 803 off-street stalls on 47 lots. Uh, the Bluff, which is uh, just adjacent to it, obviously you guys are very familiar with this, 837 on-street stalls, uh, 1,366 off-street stalls on 73 lots. Next slide, please. So before we go out and do the survey, which we did a 11 hour survey, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., we do an inventory. So a deep dive into making sure that we understand what the lay of the land is. So uh, creating maps for our surveyors. So when we do a survey, it's seamless. Um, some, some high level findings from the inventory. Um, in 2016, there were 92 stalls that were dedicated to permit only or no limit stalls. In 2021, that, uh, that number is, increased to uh, 146. The boundary did shift a little bit, um, but 119 of those are for permits, and I think it was 27, hopefully I'm doing my math right, uh, are, are no limit stalls. These are on street. On street, correct, yeah. Uh, the change in the format of the on street supply provides just over half the supply, 
so 56.1% to traditional short-term parkers. So um, uh, that's saying that essentially uh, not, uh, not that many um, short-term stalls are being prioritized. Some are, but it's just uh, usually downtowns are, have a little bit more prioritizing the customer and visitor for the short-term stall. Um, and then um, current allocation of the on-street parking to long-term long -term users, so again, that 119 stalls to, through the permits, it's not typical for a main street, focused on visitor access and growth. So um, I think we could probably go to the next slide. We can dive a little bit more into the data. Oh, but prior to doing that, this is a way that we think about parking, um, kind of in the parking industry. It's a typical um, graphic that we often put in plans and, and you'll see often. So in the middle, you can see the 70 to 85%. So we can think of parking as most efficient at that 70 to 85%. So a person drives up in a downtown, it's relatively full, but they have pretty, pretty much an ease of finding parking, a parking spot. Um, when it goes over that 85%, that's when people drive up, they can't find a stall as quickly as they would like, idling happens, they get a bit frustrated. So it's a little bit more difficult. So that's when parking management strategies really come into play and you wanna really manage that system more efficiently. Uh, the 50 to, to 69 is moderate and below 50 means you have abundance of parking in your system. So we kind of use that concept as we go through some of the data. Um, next slide, please. So uh, here is the first of many graphs you'll see that are pretty similar, but obviously breaking it down by a different day. So this is the weekday on street within the downtown. So looking at the occupancy rates in the downtown. Um, some high level findings are bullet pointed below. Um, so the 2016 hourly occupancies were higher in nine of the 11 survey hours. Um, Overall, you can see that the um, 2016 data is a bit higher, especially from 8 a.m. till 11 p.m. where it's circled, or 11 a.m., I'm sorry. Uh, we can see where those arrows are coming down. Those are the two different peaks in the different days. So in 2016, it peaked at 2 p.m. It's a little over 66% on street, whereas 2021 peaked at 60% at 1 p.m., so not far off. I think an encouraging trend is, as you see, when it becomes maybe 12 p.m., 1 p.m., we kind of get more in line with it, 16, 2016 uh, data. So, and we see a bit of a trend up towards 5 and 6 p.m., which is a nice sign. Yeah. How much effect do you think COVID and people staying away has on people? That's a great question, and that's why I was going to... Um, Pete, would you please repeat the question? I'm um, just like uh, the, the audience isn't miked, so um, and, and we're, I'm, we're going to encourage people to ask questions. Um, I'm just going to ask um, someone from Rick's team to repeat the question, yeah. and then also at the end, if people want to come up to the dais, we'll we'll take more right. questions as well. I, but feel free to and ask. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was how much of the change can we um, uh, put on COVID? And I think it's a really good question. I think that's why we wanted to do the study so we could see. Um, what the impact of COVID is. And so, yeah, I would think that this does reflect that change a bit. 2016 was also a very good year. Right about the time we were starting to get through the 2016 data, right there around 2019, everybody was saying, downtown's really booming, let's take a look at this. Um, the other thing I would say, though, is that in other studies that we're doing similar studies in other towns, and the impact that you guys have shown, I think COVID is showing this impact, but it's not as significant as we've been seeing in other cities. Uh, usually it's it's much lower. We've done Madras, Tigard, um, gosh, uh, downtown Portland, Northwest Portland, Central East Side. Um, the biggest change is what was interesting to me are those first three to four hours. That's the biggest hit. The good news is I think COVID has had an impact, of course. Now we have a new baseline. We had a good year to measure against, but it's the afternoons that uh, even though down, um, you're performing more strongly than we've seen in some other uh, uh, some other local Oregon cities. So, thanks, Rick. I'll yeah.
But a great question. So yeah. yes, there has been an impact. I think the good news for Oregon City is it, it, there's been an impact, but certainly not as substantial as we've seen in some other locations. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, we can probably go to the next slide and where we're going to look, I think, at the weekend. Yeah. So a similar bell curve, we can see a uh, little and, and similar uh, in the early morning. So that 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, also impacted. So we see a bit of a drop off from 2016 to 2021 peaking kind of at a similar point in that midday, uh, that lunchtime crowd. And then again, evening off um, in the afternoon, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, with even, a, again, a little bump up at the, at the 6 p.m. time. So people are coming in, having drinks, getting some dinner. So that's an encouraging sign. So I think it's, as Rick said, I think it's, um, Oregon City has really held, held its own and done well. Right, and I would just add that, you know, from 2 p.m. on, you know, so seven of the 11 hours um, 2016 performed better. But if you take the last five hours, um, 2021 performed better on a Saturday. Um, so again, encouraging news. So only one of the hours, uh, 5 p.m., was the 2016 data higher. So again, I, I think an encouraging trend given the challenge of COVID. Yeah, great. Next slide, please. So here we can see that information spatially so on a heat map so the uh again using that triangle those red uh block faces are the ones that are constrained considered constrained going over 85 percent so on the left we have the weekday uh which again is and this is just looking at the peak hour at 1 p.m uh, i think there are four block faces that are constrained on the weekday whereas the weekend it's more concentrated on the right there um it's more concentrated kind of in that core, but then also further north, there's a little bit of red too. Um, I think that's around the, the food carts. So, which has been a great addition to the downtown. Um, so it's, it's another way of looking at the data kind of on, on a larger scale and spatially. So, and we're gonna, we'll do the same, I think later for the bluff too. Um, and next slide, please. So here's the weekday off street. So, um, so in 2016, occupancy rates were higher in nine of the 11 hours studied. Um, more or less a similar amount of empty stalls. In 2021, 396 compared to a bit less in uh, 2016. Um, but there's some uh, ample room for absorption of additional vehicles. So in the off street system, again, this is private and public. And then we'll see uh, if we go to the next slide, the weekend off street system. And you can see it's, it's certainly a bit less, less people coming to downtown, probably less employees coming down to use the off street system. Um, occupancy rates are higher in 2021 um, in seven and 11 of the 11 hours uh, compared to 2016. Again, a similar amount of empty stalls uh, 563 empty stalls in 2021 versus uh, 565 empty stalls in 2016 at the peak hour. So again, ample room for absorption, certainly in, on the weekend. And here we can see again an occupancy map, which or a heat map, I should say, sorry, uh, looking at the peak hour weekday on the left. Um, so again, the red is higher, uh, areas of constraint, or as the green shows, uh, ample room for absorption. Um, and the, we circled the area over on the right-hand side on the, the week end, um, basically showing that there's a fair amount of room for uh, absorption of additional cars and off-street lots. Next slide, please. So now we're going to ask you to kind of shift your thinking as we turn to maybe some of the recommendations that we you were coming up with uh, using that data. So um, here's a nice graphic that kind of makes you kind of think about parking in a different way, thinking about parking trade-offs. So three elements of parking uh, being convenience, cheap, and plentiful. Uh, more or less rule of thumb is you can have two of the three, but getting all three, it's, it's not gonna happen. So uh, as you can see, as you kind of go from one to the next, um, cheap and convenient parking, but not necessarily plentiful. Cheap and plentiful parking, but not necessarily convenient. So 
essentially um, parking is a finite resource, so it's going to ebb and flow based upon market demand. So um, there are always going to be trade-offs. So you're not necessarily going to get everything when it comes to parking. And one thing I might add on that, when you go back to the pyramid um, that we showed you, the graphic of, of where you want to be, um, you want to be in that um, sort of convenient but not necessarily plentiful because that's what's good for business. That 74% to 85%, 84% range, because that shows that you have the volume of activity necessary to support business. If it's um, generally, we find if it's cheap and plentiful, the quality of business at the street level is lower. Um, so we don't want to be in the red but we would certainly love to have a parking system that supports that orange box. Uh, that means we've constantly got cars at the curb. We've got people moving in and through the downtown and turning over and spending money. So I think also think about that pyramid in the context of this graphic as well, because um, that's the goal. The target goal is a friend of mine once called it messy vitality. You know, that's your goal for parking in the downtown is that it's a little messy, but it's vital. There's activity, there's, there's form and flow, so. I was going to say the um, districts with the most sales usually have none of these things. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah. Our Main Street person. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, next slide, please. We'll <laughs> jump into some of the recommendations. And this is just introducing that we're going to focus on the downtown recommendations first. Uh, thanks. Yeah. And so first one is uh, we kind of pulled kind of bunched these together. So initially, this, we're going to talk about the on street permit. So attrition, the number of on street permits, as we mentioned, there are 119 permits um, in the system downtown. Um, and we have different peak occupancies. Um, the average length of stays are definitely skewing the, the overall average duration of stay a little bit on the higher side. So um, by attritioning the number of permits, you're basically in reinforcing that the downtown system is for the customer, for your visitor. Hopefully, as Rick mentioned, kind of turning over that stall and creating a vital downtown uh, and supporting those the retail businesses. Um, this permit would go kind of hand in hand with the next recommendation. Um, if you can go to the next one, which would be uh, evaluating uh, an in increase in the fee of the market monthly parking permits. So uh, the permits currently range from, as you can see, $20 to $60. Um, so we want to potentially um, do an evaluation to see if they should go higher. Currently, there's a bit of a wait list. So we want to bring that wait list down uh, and then really match the market rate. So um, finding that market demand is, is important. So. Uh, again, this would, again, signal that the on-street stalls are really for uh, the, the customers, and we're hopefully ratcheting down the number of on-street permits. Feel free to jump in with questions and comments um, as we go through these. This is a pretty small group, so we can talk. And I will say, um, if we do have, and yeah, absolutely jump in. I want to take advantage of the fact that your your comments and observations, but either have the, someone repeat the question. There are actually two mics here as well, so people can come up to one of these mics to, and then we'll capture your comment. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the on-street meter rates, and I flip-flopped them. Uh, so one recommendation would be to standardize all the on-street meter hourly rates. So again, down in that downtown core, which you can see in the graphic to the right, um, it's it's a dollar in that zone one, where then it's 50 cents per hour in zone two. So we would recommend just going to a dollar uh, throughout and make it consistent. And a dollar is still a, a very affordable hourly rate within the area. Um, and then eliminating those no law those no limit on street stalls. There are 27 on street stalls. Um, average duration of stay, I think, on those was was quite long, um, over seven hours. So it was skewing the data. Um, and again, if we removed those, it would encourage short term visitor and customer trips to the area. Just one thing. Yeah. Our tourism strategic plan is to increase the number or the length of time 
that customers are visiting our community to four hours. Where do you see the balance in two hour um, parking limits versus trying to get them to stay and spend more money? That, I mean, it, that's a big conversation, but um, mm. with the no limit parking, those people can stay a lot longer and spend a lot more money. I'm just, um, yeah. not necessarily that those are the people that are using yeah. those, but that. <laughs> yeah. um, how, how do you balance right. the, the trying to get the, the users that we want to use those versus the users that we don't right. want? So the, the question is, how do you find the right time stay on street? And particularly with the city's goal of bringing in more uh, tourism that theoretically would stay longer and the theoretically spend more. Um, well, one, my first answer is you got to look at the data. Um, and we have areas now where long term parking is allowed, uh, like the permits who are employees, and they're in areas that generally flash red in the peak hour. And so that means our customers can't get there. Um, the other one is again, and uh, Every city is going to be different and unique, but e even on a peak day, even in 2007, in 2016, you had close to 400 empty off street stalls during the peak hour in the downtown. Um, that's where you want to put long term off street parking, both for employees and for anybody who wants to stay longer than the on street time stays allow you. Um, so as we look at Oregon City, the data just says there's opportunity. One, we want to simplify the downtown on street system, you know, make it two hours and one dollar. Um, but then concurrently, that's why we're talking with Ryan and really, you know, focus on the word attrition and phase and move strategically. But ideally, uh, we would put all of those long trips in convenient off street lots. Then they could stay as long as they wanted. And they'd have a choice through pricing to stay two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, and then they wouldn't get a ticket. So that's a long answer, but I, I say, you know, use the data um, and we've got opportunity now. And the fact that we have the 2016 data, we know how it looked on a really good day. And to this lady's question, and we know now what it looks like post COVID and there's still opportunity. I'm going to interrupt to just say that um, we've got a, a question from Scott Riley on Zoom. Scott, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you. So you uh, keep wanting to go back to the data. Do you understand how the off street parking is currently billed um, and that those spots in most cases are, are leased out to uh, companies and individuals? Yes. But the data also shows us that on many of the lots, and we can run a filter, we have that in the report of every lot we took data on, is even those lots that are leased, um, there's empty parking stalls on them. But that's a conversation that we want DOCA um, and downtown stakeholders in the city to have with individual property owners. Because even though we show stalls being empty, it doesn't mean that they're currently available. And it's really just working in that direction to say what potential opportunity do we have to push revenue to the private sector? Um, and if they don't want to participate, we can't make them. But that's again, that's part of that phasing is to have an, a later recommendation is how do we capture opportunity that the data says is identified off street, knowing that 90% of the off street supply is in private control. And part of the verbiage you used was customers. Um, as a business owner in Oregon City, I bring millions of dollars to downtown Oregon City every year. Um, and visitors who come to my building, uh, business meetings that I hold um, in the restaurants and people that I refer to other businesses here. And so um, I'd ask that in your data and in your um, reports that you not forget that just because we're not a retail business, um, we are still a customer of most of the businesses here in, in downtown Oregon City as well as a customer to the city of Oregon City, who, you know, it, it sounds like your marching orders are to figure out how to clear up parking spots um, for the retail businesses. But I'd ask also ask the city representatives to not forget that the business owners here, 
the lawyers, um, the financial institutions that are here are also customers in this in this particular circumstance. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We we fully hear you. Nick, did you have your hand? Did, Nick, did you have a comment also? Uh, yes, uh, Nick Ferrosky. Uh, <clears throat> I did talk with uh, Scott about this a uh, little bit yesterday, and um, uh, Rick, to your point about uh, not all of the available spaces are truly available. Mm -hmm. Empty I, spaces. Are I, okay. I, the empty spaces uh, in private lots. I liken that uh, to uh, uh, somebody that owns a... Uh, three bedroom house yeah. and for 16 hours a day, those three bedrooms are vacant, but that does not mean they're available to house homeless or mm -hmm. houseless, for instance. So we have to recognize the, the, the uh, work patterns of uh, the non retail businesses uh, or the employees of retail businesses of of uh, restaurant businesses and office uh, businesses as they come and go through their day mm -hmm. and need those uh, those spaces to accommodate their flexibilities and their needs. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, again, all we can do is begin a conversation um, about the availability of parking uh, across a business day. Um, and we have that data for each of those lots. But again, it's a conversation. It's not a mandate. Um, I, I might it, make yeah. another comment. Uh, uh, it, the data looks like there's a lot of flexibility uh, to uh, maybe do a couple things. Uh, one might be to um, add, you know, the, the, the rates that the city charges uh, are pretty low compared to what the market is paying uh, and what the demand is. And um, if I uh, sp sat on the other side of the table, I could speak to the group. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, uh, and I think we need to recognize uh, that that uh, uh, some people really benefit from those low rates. There might be, I think, an opportunity. Uh, one of the questions I wrote down was uh, uh, the incidence of uh, issuance of parking tickets uh, and, and what's happened, uh, what the record might be there. Uh, but there might be an opportunity, given all that excess capacity, to add another uh, category of public parking uh, where uh, the, the rate might be more comparable to what the private lot rates are, but allow those people long-term parking in the metered on-street parking to fill up some of that unused capacity. I'll throw that out as a brainstorm. <laughs> um, and why don't we, I want to come back to it, but let's get through and when we get to the discussion, because there's options that other cities use for that, but it's, pretty out of the envelope, but I, I would be willing to discuss it with you about quote unquote, long term meters on downtown streets. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks. We'll everyone. come back to that, Nick. Yeah, we'll circle back. So th yeah, thanks for all the questions and comments. Um, so this one's a, a yeah. one you're going to see and, uh, and kind of addresses some of the questions actually is to continue to encourage off street shared use parking opportunities in private lots in downtown for both the employees and the visitors. So DOCA does a great job of that. And I know, uh, so you're going to kind of hear that uh, in both the, the downtown and in the bluff. But, um, I, and that's again, as Rick is mentioning, kind of a conversational conversation starter. And you kind of just have to beat the drum as people come and go and constantly kind of try to get the word out. So that's a big part of it. Um, next slide, please. So some considerations um, that we would uh, like to look at. So convert the existing four and eight hour stalls to three hour stalls. Uh, we have two or three hour stalls in downtown to encourage short uh, term visitor and customer stays uh, and transitioning those long term stays three hour plus to off street options or alternative modes. So uh, there are, I think, 43 
uh, total stalls between the four hour metered, eight hour metered and four hour signed. Uh, so converting those to two, or, to two, two or three hour metered stalls to better match the basically the format of the downtown and encourage customer and visitor trips. So that's one consideration. Um, we can come back with their questions or comments on that. Uh, enforcement, so another consideration. So extending enforcement hours, as I mentioned earlier, enforcement currently goes from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then stops. Um, but the data has shown us that the, that trend line basically is not falling in line early on uh, at 11 a.m., from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. So there really isn't an enforcement issue then. But then as people kind of come into the district, come in at, at 5, 6 o'clock for dinner, drinks, um, is enforcement needed uh, or wanted to better support the business hours uh, and the customers? Um, and then also consider extending enforcement to Saturdays. Um, and this is a discussion with DOCA that we would like to kind of throw out there, uh, prioritizing customer access to the business. I will say that these should be worst case scenarios <laughs> okay. because um, we, I think, um, riots. <laughs> Right, right. Happen. I think a lot of the business owners don't currently understand why we even charge for parking. So we need to do a lot of education and better management first before we consider these two options. Right. That's why they're None considerations. These, yeah, yeah. These are down the road. None of these are not absolutely. on the table, but I would say there's a lot of work we got to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Totally yeah. agree. I'm going to make a comment. This is my favorite slide so far. So, <laughs> um, and most business owners don't understand they're the problem. They're, well, they're the mentally, education is the they, problem. Well, <laughs> nobody wants to pay for parking, and we all know who's on the street after hours on weekends when there's nobody down there, and it's the employees, mm -hmm. and it's the business owners who will not pay for parking in a private lot. So mm -hmm. they are dominating the supply. Do, do we know how many um, private lot spaces are available? Because I've, I've had a really hard time finding any private parking lot owners who have leases available uh, no we don't ours was just the you know the physical op okay. goes I think to everybody's point is that we want to use the data to have a conversation and that's kind of what we want to know is is what's available uh, who's that's something yeah, that what the rates are all that Doka could potentially take that on yeah. as a kind of clearinghouse for information yeah. about private that, lot that would be ideal um, that's that's something we could potentially do. I, yeah. I can give you one sample. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I Thanks. I a lot across the street here. Thanks, Nick. Current with purchase of the Harding Building in 2006, and it has been 100 percent plus occupied since then. Yeah. But because you're know, managing even it. Even though right wow. now, yeah. you look over there and it's about half occupied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But people come that's, and go. I have yeah. not been I able bought, to find I a single. I bought the downtown lot in like maybe 2009 or 12, and it has been. 100% occupied. I've got it, and, and when I have somebody that moves out, yeah. I've got somebody, I've got a waiting list, and somebody's ready to move in. And I'm in a position where coming up here pretty soon, I'm uh, filling a, uh, just a couple vacancies in the Harding building and, and larger tenants, and I'm going to have to uh, terminate the leases of non Harding or they will be going back onto the street looking for parking. So I, I would say maybe that's a consideration as well, is that even business owners who can't find off-street parking um, also need to find a, a location. And we're, we're ge geography constrained, right? A bluff and a river. So um, I would say that they're... There's some management, I think, that... Right. Do. And I think just really quickly, is as part of the education, is if we push long-term parkers onto the street, we're pushing customers off the street. We're pushing them away. And so the, the goal of this is, you know, good parking management is to get the right car in the right stall um, and make sure that it's available. Um, but that's the conundrum we... we we need to work on and that's why I, your point is a really good one these are considerations um and I, thank you nancy i appreciate your point about you know parking is a 24-hour 
and we talk about us parking geeks of light hours in the day. And so when I build a parking lot or a garage, I'm looking at it as to what's around me that I can fill all 24 light hours with. Um, a parking lot should never shut down. Uh, and so our question is except what everybody's saying. We have the ebb and flow of customers and, and employees and retail and commercial businesses and what's the best balance. But the on-street system is actually the most valuable resource you have. The public has. So those are great comments. Really so, good comments. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this will be a consideration uh, moving forward. Yeah. And <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, Next slide, please. So then uh, the bluff, uh, this is just an intro slide. So just again, interconnectedness between the downtown and the bluff. So both of these being that they're adjacent to one another, despite you know the geographic kind of constraints, you are connected by that elevator and then it evens out, especially as you go further north. So um, the, the recommendations will have an impact on one another. So uh, we can dive into the recommendations then. So next slide, please. So. Um, this is a, a map of basically uh, the, the zoning within the area that we, we surveyed on the bluff. So the red area are the commercial areas and the blue are the residential. So um, the first recommendation is uh, converting the no limit residential stalls uh, in the blue areas to uh, two hour or by permit. So this kind of will work in concert with some of the, re the commercial recommendations, which will then time limit the commercial. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But we want to protect the residential neighborhoods. So the priority user in the blue is the residents because that is zoned for residential. So we want to have them have the ability to use a permit on street, uh, but then ask if customers want to come or visitors want to come, they're time limited to two hours. Uh, this may have to have a, an expansion of the residential parking permit district within the area on the bluff. So th this again goes hand in hand with the next rec recommendation set of recommendations, which you could go to. Yep. Um, so looking now at the red on that map, the commercial area implement three hour time limits on the blocks adjacent to commercial areas. Um, and then to basically mitigate any conflicts or issues, uh, sell a controlled number of on-street employee permits. So those employees that uh, can't potentially use alternative modes or have trouble finding off-street parking, potentially uh, looking at occupancy numbers up on the bluff in commercial areas, sell a controlled number of employee permits in the areas that are have low occupancy that have the ability to absorb uh, some cars parking there for a longer period of time. Um, so, and then that would be reassessed with routine data collection. So then you can understand the ebbs and flows of the parking on street and the occupancy numbers. Um, and then the bottom one is the off street system on the bluff, uh, similar to the downtown encourage off street shared use parking. So hopefully some of those employees do find uh, places off street um, or in alternative modes. Looks like, yep, Vicki. Um, yes, having lived and worked on the bluff for 15 years, um, and I was involved in the original study you did, yeah. Um, and we talked about how this can only work on the block if there is enforcement. And there has been no enforcement. Uh, and, you know, I know the city tries, but their money is tight and they don't have the personnel to do it. But um, I have people in parking all day long next to my business mm -hmm. in a two hour slot. Yeah. Um, and they're employees a lot from businesses that don't have their own off street parking. Right. Uh, and it's just not working. Right. We couldn't agree with you more. Um, real quick, rule one of parking management, nothing works if you don't enforce it. Um, and so your point, there's, there's no better response than to say yes, it needs to come. Something like this that quote unquote is adding a little bit more sophistication to the on street system and this um, uh, di differentiation between a residential block face and a commercial block face will require exactly that. And my other comment is you talk about selling a controlled number of on-street employee parking permits. Um, my, my manual, my employee manual says, my employees, if there's no room in my employee lot because I do have off-street parking for my employees, mm -hmm. they have to park down the street. They can't park in front of my business. Right. 
-hmm. And um, but they're parking in front of somebody else's business. Right? No, because it's residential. Well, it's yeah. residential. But they're, yeah, they're. Yeah. Um, but, but generally, <laughs> but what are you doing? But you don't. Yeah. Actually, you're no. But actually, no, I, I understand. No, because my employees don't do it because I have seven law. Right. right. I have yeah. seven spaces off. Um, right. Off street yeah. for my employees. So I don't have my people out in the neighborhood right. doing it. Well, so uh, I'm just thinking yeah. for downtown, a lot of a lot of the businesses say don't park in front of your employment, um, but then they're parking in front of your employment. <laughs> right. And so uh, that's I think that's and, a problem. That, that, that is a problem. Up. I was telling Ryan, the restaurant across the street from me, they have employees who park in front of World Hearts Fair Trade all day long. And Robin told me, she said she had to go and talk to them and say, please, you know, right. I, can't even see my sign because they parked there all day. Yeah, what we're trying to do on the bluff is, like in the downtown, we saw specific opportunities. The on-street system is way more constrained than on the bluff. And that's why we're seeing a controlled number on commercial streets, uh, not in front of businesses. The goal is to get residents and their guests and visitors into residential on-street parking and to get employees hopefully on the bluff off street but for a limited time while we're working on that third bullet point shared parking is to allow transitional permit on the bluff on street for employees but it would never create it's controlled so it would never create an oc occupancy situation yeah we're trying to get employed all contain the commercial parking in the commercial area and contain the residential parking in the residential area. And right now there's, you know, we didn't bring the data because we're gonna bring that to the bluff when we meet with uh, McLaughlin, but um, there's very low occupancies right now throughout the district. So we want to take advantage of that. There's some constraints in some s s small areas, but we wanna take advantage of that and um, protect the neighborhoods. Um, I, I would, I don't want to be overly pessimistic, mm -hmm. but having owned a building up there for more than 15 years and knowing that there's no enforcement, yeah. and I keep hearing there's enforcement, there's going to be enforcement, I would want to make sure that um, there's a city budget requirement on an annual mm -hmm. basis for parking enforcement, um, and I know they do a great job when they have the resources, um, before you, you implement oh, yeah. these kinds of things. Nancy. I just wanted to mention that regulating parking costs money. And so everybody needs to share the burden. The There should be paid parking up on the bluff. There should be paid parking in the uh, north end of town as well as, as it continues to grow and impact the rest of the city. Everybody needs to pay their fair share. And nobody, no employee is going to park and pay for parking in a private lot when they can play the game on the street for free. They're not going to do it. And to your point, Liz, earlier about the longer term parking, the there are I get to be downtown, as you well know. I get to be Vanna. Oh, you're all I making good, you're, you're, you, you, you're all making good comments. We want to make sure these get done. So, as you know, the, about the um, the long term meters that are on uh, 99E, for example, they're 50 cents an hour. So, who are they used by? They're used by employees at the courthouse to get there first thing in the morning and they don't leave. They play the move, you know, musical cars. So the visitor who needs a longer term meter never gets the chance or the opportunity to utilize it. So it's a pricing, definitely a price point issue. It's an enforcement issue. One enforcement officer cannot do all of downtown. Downtown was expanded. One person could barely do it when we only focused in one end in the core. All of downtown is a core now. It's all active. So everyone needs to pay their fair share. Uh, enforcement needs to be picked up to probably one person on the bluff to include 7th Street uh, past Midway. I mean, it, it's impacting everybody. And definitely oh, down by the food carts, I can't even imagine. Um, and with them with uh, Lithia as well um, on street, uh, you just can't get back and forth for one hour or two hour. It takes that long to get through the district to even get chalk on the tire or electronic chalk on the tire. <laughs> Good points. So, Thank you, both of you, for those. And Ryan's points. doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing personal, Ryan. It's not you. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you guys for those comments. Really appreciate it. Yeah.
Um, so I think next we're going to transition to the, the system wide, I believe. Uh, yeah, so you can just go to the next one. Yeah. So um, these are more probably directed towards the city. Um, and Kelly mentioned the TDM work group initially, and they're doing a great job. I know Ray is on the call and he, he's involved um, in this. So, um, oh, so is Nick. Sorry. <laughs> All right, everyone's involved in the TDM work group. Sorry about that. I don't want to call. Um, but yeah, uh, you guys are doing a great job. So continue that. Uh, public involvement is a really critical component of any good parking management plan. So even doing what we're doing right now, getting community input is is critical. So we can give out recommendations, but they may be theoretical and not necessarily work in your community. So by providing that feedback, it's it's huge. Um, so one thing is to produce an annual parking performance status dashboard. So this is an, a concept that's kind of coming up in different communities and municipalities where we um, encourage uh, municipalities to basically put their different metrics of parking, whether it be occupancy rates, number of permits sold, um, number of uh, tickets issued on their website. So just so it's a, a one-stop shopping, so everyone kind of is on the same playing field and kind of then you can kind of have some better discussions potentially at the TDM work group or, um, and then it's also a great place for the city to look and see how they're doing kind of from a year to year basis. Um, and then measure performance. So exactly what we did here, uh, it's an inc uh, important thing. So routine measurement um, where, and I know COVID set us back a year, but um, parking utilization and understanding how you're doing is, is critical for making decisions and pivoting too, because, the community is always growing. Uh, Oregon City is doing a great job of growing that north area by the food carts, as I mentioned, is really expanded. So um, growth is good and vi vitality is good. So it's a good thing to measure. Um, I think there might be a one or two more slides. Yeah, so uh, next step, as Kelly did a better job of kind of outlining the next steps in the early going. So we're going to kind of take this show on the road, go to the McLaughlin neighborhood too. I don't have that in there. Um, get their input on some of the bluff feedbacks um, and then kind of wrap up some of these recommendations and do a finalized report and then ultimately present this to city council. It sounds like May or June. So, um, so I know it was a small group, but, uh, and we answered, we did a lot of Q and A during this. So, uh, but certainly have lots of time if there are more questions or comments. Yeah. I did want to let folks know that there will be another discussion that's being hosted on the bluff a week from today on April 19th at four o'clock, um, where there's going to be a, a discussion of this information. Um, it's being hosted at the at the hive. So that'll be an hour long conversation to gather input. Um, has the date for the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association been scheduled? Not yet. Not yet. No, okay, that one so not. You, and can I clarify is the, the one on the 19th that's Fo that conversation will be focused on the bluff. Correct. Manage. Okay. What time is that one? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Okay. Nick? One of the issues that uh, uh, I've run into comments from downtown uh, uh, employees is the uh, transition uh, up the elevator and getting off at the top of the elevator. Um, I uh, toured that with uh, John Lewis one time and we looked at options to kind of improve that area up there to make it more inviting, less scary. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've had just, you know, an awful lot of uh, primarily uh, women tenants that do not want to get off the top of the elevator in uh, darkness. <laughs> And winter darkness is even worse and longer hours. And, and I would, so this has been a discussion going on for years, but I'd really encourage the city to um, try to work with the property owner up there and allocate some money to increase the security, maybe provide, um, you know, a place where my daughter went to college, you know, they had these emergency uh, lighted kiosks that uh, you could run over and punch the button and and uh, if if there was some issue but but uh, I think that would help the connectivity uh, between the bluff and downtown it's a great point um, I remember when the first plan um, remember uh, one of the contingencies of using some of the periphery lots was that the city would add sidewalk and lighting improvements into their capital improvement 
improvement plan back in 2009. Um, so that's a really good point, Nick. And I think we'll add that to the notes is, you know, explore safety improvements to make the connection feel safer and more comfortable for users. Uh, but that was in the last plan and the city did it. And I think it had a lot of impact on the overall growth of the core. So good point. I'd just like to repeat something I said earlier because it wasn't captured. Um, and that is when you talk about expanding parking on the bluff in any respect, uh, and we have to have enforcement, um, I think we need to have that tied to budgetary allocations by Good the city or else we shouldn't do it. Good point. Um, I'd like to talk about the pricing of the um, zoned permitting. Um, I know that it's not comparable to private parking lots, and we are seeing a lot of people hold on to permits that they're not using, especially post-COVID, when they, they hope to eventually have an employee. They don't want to go back on the wait list. So I see where we need to raise those prices, but I also want employees to be able to afford those that are making minimum wage so that they're not on the street, that they actually do. So there, there's a balance there that I think we have to really consider um, because we don't want them on the street. Um, so I, I think that there's a real conundrum at that point. Yeah. Well, in the industry and what we would want to do, particularly for employee parking, is you would have what's called a stratified system of rates. And it, the premium would be in the near term until it's attritioned away. Any on-street parking in the core comes at a premium. And then as you move outward and upward, the price comes down. Right now, regardless, kind of, you know, you're in that, that price range that's currently that um, Pete showed for rates. Um, but literally what you're trying to do is encourage people to make a choice. So if you want the premium parking, there's a limited amount available and here's the price. And then they might think also about, well, I wonder what the bus would cost me or what if I carpool or whatever. Um, and, but then we have these other, um, uh, I know in, in like Vancouver, Washington, they, they go down as low as $20 per month, but they're, <laughs> it's a bit of a hoof um, and then the choice is to the user but first we have to make the parking available but you're right the more we can stratify rates to encourage people to use space that's not being used the more we should uh, try to do it it's a really good point um, one of the other things i noticed um i talk a lot with the albany main street director yeah. um, and they manage Get their own plan. parking yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they have uh, they make every employee downtown register their vehicle. And if they see their license plate within, you know, the main core of the area, they get ticketed. Um, and it doesn't matter where or if they paid for, for parking or anything. Yeah. Um, if an employee is parking in that core area, they're going to get a ticket. Corvallis um, has a similar program. Yeah. I don't know. That, just a thought. Okay. Good. Um, uh, Rick, did, did you guys uh, work on the parking study for Coeur d'Alene when they built their structure? We didn't do the study. They had us come in and look at the finances and the funding of that. Uh, but we haven't done any downtown work, just the private developer who was doing some the construction. Okay. I don't We're know, aware of Coeur d'Alene. I don't know uh, anything about the economics of that, and I was curious uh, if there were any data about... Uh, uh, how the downtown business core has uh, been impacted yeah. by having a having a structure. They they have the advantage of also having the Coeur d'Alene Resort. Yeah. <laughs> with, uh, yeah. No. We right again. Next door. We, we we were on sort of can they make it pencil? But one thing I wanted to do really quick, if you allow me, um, was to answer Nick's question. Remember, I said we would come back, and it goes to kind of your point about pricing as well. But this would be on street pricing. There are some cities who meter their downtown for 10 hours, um, but it's a progressive rate system. And Albany, New York is the best example. Um, they have a goal, and you know, technology allows them to do that now, is that 85% of their transactions, the goal is that they would be two hours or less. 
And so they priced that first two hours. And then the third hour, the fourth hour, the fifth hour, the sixth hour, the seventh hour become progressively more expensive, which then discourages employees because you get past three hours and you might as well go get a monthly permit or a transit pass. Um, there are cities who have totally failed with 10 hour parking because their hourly rate might be a dollar an hour and then it's 20 cents an hour for 10 hours. You know, they, they think, well, because we're allowing them a longer time stay, we should charge them less. Um, not a lot of cities do it, um, but, uh, but the technology is there, but it's not just a $1 an hour for eight hours or $1 an hour for 10 hours or 50 cents an hour. It is a progressively more um, prohibitive rate based on a turnover goal. So they're not giving, and this is particularly important, I think for DOCA, is it's particularly important in those cities that have gone to that method to keep the turnover. So 85% of our trips, they have to be two hours or less. And they did that through data that says the average customer stays less than two hours, you know, in the overall aggregate. But by the third or fourth hour, <clears throat> if you really want to stay downtown for four hours, you'll pay for it. Um, but you get to those upper hours and, um, you know, the options, the type of options for you become more apparent. The last thing I'll say is also is that if they're not getting the 85%, the third, fourth, fifth, an hour are almost automatically raised so that they're keeping that performance. So that I wanted to give you that. I don't want to take anything off the table, but there are cities do it. But to do it right, I think the Albany example is something that not all Albany, Oregon, Albany, New York, is something you might look at. Is that something that can be factored into these new kiosks, uh, payment kiosks? <laughs> new rates. Variable rates. Yeah, that'll all be up for consideration at the commission. Yeah. Well, the last thing I'll say, but what they find out is that most people don't use the longer term parking option because they'll go somewhere else. Well, that can be eliminated by uh, pay by license plate with, as a, a combination of that. So if they want to come back and try it again, they've got to put their license plate number back in and then they're going to get a ticket. Um, so that's how they control it. In the early years, yeah, that was a problem. I just come back every two hours and go for two more hours. But now you can do it by license plate. And you're not allowed to do that. Um. I guess one of the things you mentioned that we're underutilizing is private lots. And what are your recommendations? Because we can't, I mean, we, we have a couple of shared lots that are nights and weekends, um, but that's that's kind of the most that we've ever done to utilize that the private lots. Um, and I think we've got most of the people that are interested in participating in that program. Um, how else in other communities have you seen that work um, where, you know, businesses that are kind of off hours or, you know, need availability, mm -hmm. um, how do you utilize those parking lots better? Great question. And there's a lot of examples. But the best, again, I know uh, I always come back to this, is education, data, persistence, and that it's a peer-to-peer -peer conversation not a conversation between the city and a private owner. The city simply should be a facilitator to say, we have data, I'll use you as an example, DOCA has looked at it and DOCA and their members would like to have a conversation with you. So that's the first step. The second step is money, um, is the degree to which a shared program can direct traffic, whether it's permits or visitors into a lot and say the money is yours. Um, we don't. This, again, it's a conversation between the business community and the business communities. The city is simply saying we'll help. Um, Kirkland, Washington, um, at one time offered up pay stations, so they because they got a grant, and so they said if you make this um, a visitor lot, we'll buy the pay station and you'll own it, and then you'll take it from there. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's that convincing people that stalls are available, or I shouldn't say that, 
convincing people the stalls are empty, that they should make them available, and DOCA and the city can bring partners to them. I know a business that has two employees. I know a business that has six employees. Um, our data shows they don't have to take you up on it, but I think it's just persistence. We found in some cities that, like you have, you started with three or four lots where people say, okay, yeah, you could use my lot for this specific purpose. And, and then coming back annually or every other year or every, and saying, you know, the, the data shows nothing's changed here. Um, you still have stalls available. Uh, continue to fit work with us. And then number three, and particularly in Main Street cities, is the degree through that education effort that you can convince um, businesses that parking is a community resource. That if they're, what's good for them is good for downtown, but what's good for downtown is good for them. And that's the Main Street philosophy. You know, in big cities, it's hard to say parking is a community resource, right? Huge tall buildings and massive numbers of property owners. Um, so those are the three points I would say. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's the most successful shared use programs are the ones that are just consistently, like Pete says, banging the drum. Um, and based in a, a reality of, of real data, and then you can have a conversation. Is that something that maybe we could put together is like different ideas of how to utilize those so that when we do start having conversations mm -hmm. with private owners that we have ideas that maybe if this isn't going to work, then something else might yeah. or. Yeah, and it's even to have conversations about um, what prevents you from doing this. Because um, some people will say, well, I don't want to tie my property up. You say, okay, these, these leases are month to month. I mean, there's hurdles you can get over. What if it doesn't work? Well, you call DOCA. Um, it's self-enforcing. Um, there's a, just a, and it, these shared use programs actually, actually work good, better, in small, medium-sized Main Street towns than they do in large cities. Because by the time you get to large cities, the ability to pay for new parking is more feasible. It's just not feasible for you guys to add parking right now without some huge sugar daddy or mom <laughs> that can put a huge amount of money on the table and say, okay, we're going to add parking. So shared use is really a, a wise economic effort, but whether it fails or succeeds, again, it's just a part of an ongoing conversation. What's the structure? Okay, the question was, what is structured parking cost these days? <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we've just done some work with an economics firm. Uh, we also participated uh, and helped um, in the development of the uh, Beaverton Central Garage, which had the luck of having a huge amount of upfront money. Um, and the average cost of a built structure above grade now is between forty-five and sixty-five thousand dollars a stall, um, and so that a lot of that range is dependent upon land cost, is dependent upon design requirements, um, financing partners. Um, but yeah, forty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars a stall. Um, so it's very difficult. <laughs> That's why I'm saying our hope is someday you can build a garage if you need one. But until you create the economic environment that allows it to occur, it's going to be very difficult. So, so to put, some... put some perspective on that. I don't have my HP with me, but uh, to amortize a uh, uh, forty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars stall, what that what's that cost a month? Oh, but what your mortgage would be? <laughs> what your parking rate would be? Oh, well, I'm going to tell you what your mortgage would be. So let's say you build a forty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars stall. And um, you want it to finance itself, you know, because a lot of municipal, you know, a lot of garages come with multiple funding sources. But can a garage support itself? Um, your monthly need would be between 270 and 340 per month in cash, 12 months of the year. Fully occupied. It would be <laughs> fully occupied at very high rates. 
but now again, I, I don't want to poo poo that because you know there are creative finance, there's urban renewal, and there's all sorts of different ways to make the pot come down. You know, most garages, municipal or par public private partnerships, are built with different pots of funds. So there's what the garage can generate, um, how you play with the land, um, urban renewal, fee and lieu programs, um, grants. Um, but yeah, if you were just to build, a, I always call it when you build a parking stall, consider it a mortgage on your house. So you can go into a mortgage calculator, type in 65,000 over 20 years, which is what most private garages try to do, and it'll give you the number. That's why we believe the shared use is such a huge opportunity here. Uh, I, I, I been thinking about the shared use potential of Summit Development's North End project. I'm sorry, the last part? Summit Development's North oh. End project, uh, uh, proposing to bring 550 uh, uh, housing units, uh, mixed use, and uh, a variety of commercial, including tourism. And uh, their goal of uh, a plan of, of uh, providing connectivity to downtown uh, via a uh, trolley, a uh, trolley system that they would privately uh, uh, they implement. They will not operate. <laughs> <laughs> Already asked. Okay. And um, the uh, um, there's a, there's a lot of you know there'd be a lot of housing addition you know added which would, yeah. to my opinion, be a tremendous benefit to downtown, and they would park up there. <laughs> which would also be a benefit to downtown, is my understanding. Um, the uh, issue is the, uh, the uh, construction on the, on the landfill that requires That's structural pilings. <laughs> and once upon a time when uh, Fred Bruning was going to bring uh, the rivers and Cabela's to town, that uh, structural piling cost was about $18 million. And now with other issues involved, now that number is uh, forecasted uh, in some of its numbers to be in the 40 million that, and it's in an urban renewal area, but the city doesn't want to participate in that. And I think the study is going on right now. There's still debate. I don't want to jump ahead of the decisions by the city council and urban renewal agency, but that's been a, a, a quite a hang up and a lot of heel dragging going on in that area. And to me, to have that large capacity up there where you've got flexibility uh, for shared use and connectivity to downtown would have, could bring tremendous uh, flexibility to this issue right here. I do know that Summit is coming back to the Urban Renewal Commission later this month in April. So yeah, yeah for I think for brownfield uh, uh, funding, but not for the construction issue. So well, we have 10 minutes. Keep going. Oh, well, yeah. Um, that brought up an idea that we've been talking about at DOCA is um, it really is employees that are causing the main issue, the, the main I don't know. Yeah. Um, concern with parking downtown. And so we've talked about potentially doing a satellite parking like mm -hmm. Oregon City Shopping Center and use, using things like the Clackamas County shuttle to get employees mm -hmm. down. Um, what would that be part of this parking study that we could potentially do a, you know, public transit system, like mini public transit system um, within that to to get employees out of the downtown completely? Um, or well, if I remember, that was a, a long term strategy in the TDM plan. Yeah, yes, the TDM plan does include, um, you know, for medium or long term, yeah. you know, kind of looking at shuttles. Um, and I'll say, you know, we have the new Clackamas County Connects shuttle. Yeah. I think the route planning for that, the goal of it was to try to reach parts of the city that are not currently served by transit. So it has a really big, windy, route that takes quite a long time. So it doesn't, I don't think it effectively serves downtown um, for employees, right? Because they want something that's more direct, like I'm gonna park here, I'm gonna take my shuttle that comes every five or 10 minutes and I'm gonna get to downtown, you know? And that's not what the Clackamas um, Connect shuttle does. Um, so I think, you know, we don't have anything like that right now that works, but any alternative mode, like a 
bicycle, a scooter, a, you know, scooter share, um, you know, like a shuttle, um, you know, providing be transit benefits to employees, like that, those things will all tip the scales in favor of people doing something other than parking downtown on the street. Um, so those are all elements of the TDM plan. So it, um, are we looking at other private lots or, or public lots that are underutilized outside of the area, or are we just focusing downtown at the moment? You know, I think uh, for the shared parking yeah. program, um, we haven't looked, we haven't looked beyond, you know, I think we haven't looked beyond walking distance, okay. right? Because we don't have a way to get people between A and B unless they're walking. Um, I see a hand up from Scott Riley. So in looking at alternatives for employees parking outside the downtown corridor, I, I uh, have a little bit of a challenge with uh, the DOCA representative and what they brought up. But um, that being said, I'd like to, to keep in focus here that uh, employers today are having, are having challenges. Walk up and down Main Street and look for your help wanted sign. If we push the, the convenience of the employees outside of the corridor, um, that's something to take into consideration um, as you're gathering data and, you know, would probably encourage everybody to pull the employers and what the challenges may be to em continuing to employ people in the downtown corridor here. Um, you know, and looking at the demographics of those who utilize Oregon City for their businesses, be it restaurants, bars, lawyers, banks, um, or institutions like myself, um, where those folks are coming from. Um, I would, most of my folks are coming in from um, around the area. They're not locals. Um, and pushing them to have to park outside of the downtown area um, means that I'll probably have to relocate my business to an area that, that does allow parking. Um, so, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variables to take into consideration here um, as we continue to march forward with, uh, with these plans and parking. Um, but a lot of the conversation I've heard today really focuses on uh, what the retail folks are doing. Um, and, and I would have you look and see what, what they're really paying into um, into this. I think that the, everybody serves a valuable purpose in, in, the, um, in the economic plan here in Oregon City, but I, I really haven't heard that here today. Scott, sorry, I, I didn't mean to imply that everyone should get rid of their employees. I just meant <laughs> to say that we should make it an option. And I think the other thing to look at here is um, what should be expected of new businesses versus businesses that are here before the plan takes effect um, or plans take effect. Asking businesses that have been here um, prior to any plans, um, you know, that, that could be looked at. Setting expectations um, certainly can be looked at as we as we more move forward. Thank you, Scott. Um, we just have a couple minutes li left, and I do want to remind folks there will be some other opportunities to give feedback to um, to some of these recommendations. Um, I mentioned that the the Hive is hosting a, a meeting for businesses on the bluff next Tuesday, April nineteenth, at four o'clock at the Hive. Um, we are interested in hosting um, a conversation downtown. Um, I'll be reaching out to some business owners downtown to schedule that in the next four weeks. Um, and then, Kelly, when did you say city council? We don't have it scheduled yet, but... We don't have a date. I think we want to make sure we can talk to all of our stakeholders first. Um, and so McLaughlin Neighborhood Association, um, the Bluff meeting, uh, maybe a meeting focused on downtown core, and then also the North End um, is, is a kind of a target area. Um, and I will add too that uh, folks can also always send comments or questions to um, to me or to Anne um, by email, um, and we will post this video on on the internet, um, probably on the city's YouTube channel, and make that available. And then um, any questions, you know, you can share it with folks who couldn't make it today, and we'll take questions, and um, we can then kind of keep your contact info so we can keep you updated and let you know when that work session is scheduled with the city commission um, and any other announcements that we have related to this topic. I did want to ask, will the, the slides that you've um, shared be available to 
Okay, so for folks, um, we can share the slides uh, that you saw today in the PowerPoint. Thanks, everybody, for the yeah, great conversation. Thank you. Right. thank you all for coming.